How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Gangin. I want to discuss the preliminary report that was done by the independent investigators who uh, investigated the riot at Delaware on February 1st, which left one of our, our heroes uh, dead, unfortunately, by the name of Lieutenant Stephen Floyd. Again, if you're not familiar with the show, the show's Tear Talk. It's a show dedicated to law enforcement. You can follow us on multiple venues, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, YouTube, Speaker.com, Player FM, Stitcher Radio. The list is growing. Uh, you can follow us also on an app, iOS, and Samsung devices as well as my Facebook page, 24,000 followers. But guys, I gotta get the traffic to the YouTube channel. So I have about 158 subscribers. Let's get it built, let's get it going, because the videos up there remain more permanent, that's the key. So please subscribe and share my YouTube channel if you haven't subscribed already. Okay, so I wanna discuss the preliminary report about what happened in Delaware, the riot on February 1st that left one of our own heroes dead. Um, and it was sad. But before I, I discuss that, I wanna make note that this was national news, guys. So for those in management, you have no excuse when right now what's going on at your facility and you know what's happening, well, this is the outcome. So you have no excuse that says you didn't know this was going to happen. Okay, you, you, you have no excuse. You guys got to read this report. Okay, it talks about understaffed facilities, which is a national issue right now. Maybe go as far as international issue. Delaware is the outcome of an understaffed facility. So for those facilities across the nation that are going through this, this is the outcome. So you can't ignore it anymore. It's out there. It's for you to read, for you to learn. Learn it. Educate yourself. Okay, for frontline staff, you also should be reading this as well. Okay, you gotta read this. Because again, what happens at in Delaware could easily happen at your facility. So now check this out. A couple of months ago, I had Jeffrey Klopp on my show. He's the president of the Correctional Union out there in Delaware. And he said something key. He said that this could have been prevented. And it's funny because when you read the independent investigation, the report, it's what they say, that the issue could have been prevented. So it's echoed, you know, from what Jeffrey Klopp said a few months back. Okay, so some of the concerns that they noted were definitely communication between uh, front line to management and then also management down the front line. Okay, communication is key. Okay, that's why they trump this concern. That's why this concern is paramount because this is pretty much the uh, no communication leaves any facility vulnerable. Okay, which means that management has to have that open door policy to talk to frontline uh, front staff. And frontline has to feel that if they state these concerns, um, and the concerns are real, obviously, and they state the concerns, management's not gonna retaliate against them. You know, they have to have a trust for management. And I feel in this case here, m m management, or at least frontline staff, believe that management wasn't listening. And these were concerns about being understaffed, having employees working many hours, many hours, just tired, you know, 80 hours on top of their regular 80 hour every uh, two week work week. Um, also, the equipment being dated, I and mean, then equipment is what we use to save our lives, and you have dated equipment. So if I know my radio is not working, I'm doing reports like crazy. I'm setting those reports up. You know, management's got to be able to read those reports and say, hey, well, we got equipment that's not working. We got to put money in, and we got to get these guys new equipment. We got to get these officers new equipment. Um, and then again, we talked about understaffing, you know, you know, the posts that are being cut before you even hire, you know, and who are we hiring? You know, you, you got officers that are working three, four doubles a week. They're getting mandated. They're getting mandated. Where's their balance? Where's their chance to go home? You know, balance, get a little rest, spend time with their family. Instead, they're at work frustrated because they're missing every moment because they don't know if they're going to go home or not. They can't make plans because they don't know if they're going to get stuck. And also, when you're hiring, we're hiring out of desperation when you're mandating overtime because there's not enough manpower. $39 million in overtime. I believe it said it came up to something like $800,000, something uh, uh, every two weeks. Uh, and overtime. So the thing is, are we hiring someone that can do the job or are we just hiring it just to fill the post? So it's quality versus quantity. You know, and also, if, if, if I'm working the post, you know, and that's my partner, can I trust this person? You know, I'm not saying he's not a good officer or I'm not saying she's not a good officer, but the point is this person's tired. This person's beat. Who are you putting next to me? Because my life depends on this individual. Do you care enough about my life? Because I don't feel you do if you're going to be putting people that are exhausted because they work three or four doubles already. You know, so again, the understaffing is definitely a concern. And when they talk about cutting posts, remember, guys, just management, feel me on this, okay, please. When you deal with 
corrections. You always got to prepare for the worst. So to the uneducated, you see a team that may, may not have been used for the last four months because the facility is quiet. Well, guess what? Their presence alone helps deter uh, any type of negative behavior that an inmate wants to promote. So when you get rid of the team that's preventable, because that team is a preventive measure, then it leaves the staff vulnerable. So when you cut posts that you think are relatively inactive, and then frontline may argue with that and say, well, wait a second, you know, I understand on paper it looks like the this post is inactive, but having said that, this is what this person does, which you may not see on paper, or if an emergency happens, this is what we need to do with this person or with this post. You gotta listen to that. Because all because that post is not being utilized at that moment, that post could be set for an emergency, like a team on standby. Well, hasn't been nothing happened in four months. Why do we need that team on standby? Well, again, you need that team because that team prevents. Sergeant knows if I, guess what? If I have a team in the background, if I have a team ready, I can go to the wing, see what's going on, knowing that my team is going to get there. By the time they get there, I have a little bit of an idea of what's going on. I don't send them to respond blindly. But what about if there is no team? Now I got to fight to get people. I got I got to scramble a little bit. And now we're all going to the situation together. Now we may have to act and now we're going in blindly, in which case people are going to get hurt. So all because you may see something as being inactive doesn't mean it's not needed. We always have to prepare for the worst. Sometimes people in these higher positions, they plan for the best. That's not corrections. That's anybody on the front line. That's not corrections. And again, when you're dealing with a facility that's understaffed, and you're mandating the same people, you're dealing with people that are tired. They're exhausted. You know, they're just they're just tired, you know? And then they gotta work a position that may require them to be alert. And if they happen to fall asleep because they're exhausted after working four doubles, we're gonna hold that individual responsible. But what about worst case scenario is if I need that person, I come onto the shift, I'm relatively new, you send somebody next to me who's worked four doubles straight, mandated. Do you think I think that person can uh, get my back if needed? I'm walking the wing. Am I concerned this person's not going to fall asleep or just be exhausted that maybe he can't properly or she can't properly respond to my need? I'm asking management to protect the front line. That's a way to protect the front line. And how we do that, and it's what they mentioned in um, the preliminary, is that you got to have the incentives. You know, the incentives to maintain the good employees. You know, we got to keep them. And the incentives to invite good qualified people for this job. Corrections is law enforcement. You should not be settling. You should not be settling for anybody. That's desperation. And in that desperation, you're going to put the wrong person next to me. I'm trusting that you're exhausting every effort to find the right person for the job. So when I walk next to this person, I feel comfortable. Somewhat comfortable knowing that you did what you had to do to put the best person on tier with me. But what about if we're hiring out of desperation? What about if I'm looking around and I can see that there's better offers at Walmart and at a McDonald's than there is for the Delaware Department of Corrections? Then the person that takes that job, I really got to wonder, why would you take this job unless you weren't qualified for a Walmart job? Unless you weren't qualified for a McDonald's job? That makes me think, are you qualified for this job? And now I'm mad at management because you're just putting anybody next to me. Anybody. Because again, Quantity versus quality. Desperation mode, we're seeking what? Quantity. Guys, not in this world. Gotta have quality. I gotta trust the person next to me. And management, even though things look good on paper, you gotta go to your front line because they'll tell you reality. Remember, they're right, right in those areas. They know things the best. If you don't have that communication with them, you're not gonna know what's happening. So you gotta keep that open door. So again, they mentioned the concerns. The number one concern was communication. I have to agree. You know, and again, if there's something management cannot do, there's nothing wrong with explaining it to the employees because the employees will find a way to make it work. Frontline will always find a way to make it work as long as they understand that there's a reason behind why it couldn't work. You know, and that's okay. We're allowed to give those reasons. I mean, come on. Um, second thing, as they mentioned, was gangs. You know, that's going to be tough. You know, gangs are a growing problem. You know, any, any facility you go to, gangs are a growing problem because there's the conflict there. You know, you, you really can't house rival gang, gang members together because that's a threat. And that's a threat to the inmates as well as staff. Um, so sometimes we're stuck in an impossible situation where guess what we have to do? We may have to put same-sex gangs together 
you know, belong to a certain subculture. And that's because it keeps the peace inside the prison. But the sad thing is, is the officer then becomes overwhelmed because, again, you have an in inmates that are united, you know, against one officer. You see, most of the time we have an issue, the issue is usually with a selected group of people. Um, now, with, you know, gangs, uh, the inmates could be united, you know, or they can unite on a justified cause that they believe is a justified cause. I mean, we see that all the time. Um, Especially, I'm sure, related to Delaware riots, there was a justified cause in their mind. Again, so you have inmates that are already united. So now the problem is, how do we make it safe for the officer? Well, sometimes, again, this could be an impossible situation. We can't house rival gang members together. But one thing you can do is give the officers the knowledge needed so they can make some choices at their discretion. Because, again, they're working on the front line. So having said that, the more knowledge I have the better. Now, some people may be protective of this knowledge. I never understood why about that. I, I never did. Like, when you're talking about gang knowledge, about who's who and what set they represent and what culture they belong to, and, and, and you don't want to give that to front line, you're making front line very vulnerable because, trust me, the inmates on the unit, they know it. They know that. They know who belongs to what group. They know that because they G-check those inmates the moment they come into that door. You know what I mean? They know that. So the fact that you're not telling your officers, you're making the officers vulnerable. So now when the officers are walking their unit, walking a dorm or whatever it is, um, they don't know if they're piling all the inmates into one area that are representative of that one group. They don't know. And you got to give the officers that knowledge so they can do some internal movements, so they can make it safer for them. As management, I'm going to ask the officers, listen, I, I know I'm overburdening you with these gangs, I, but you know how it is. It's a prison. You know, I, it's a concern. Uh, but again, I can't put them in this unit because they're beefing with this group. So I, I, I know I feel like I'm kind of flooding your area, which it, it may seem to be unsafe, but I'm kind of, you know, stuck here. What can, what can, what can you do? Like, is there anything that you can do to help it make, make, make it safer for you? You know, give me some advice. You know, how would you like to move these inmates in your area? You know, you got to give the officer that because the officer is going to know. You know what? That makes sense. You know, it makes sense that you can't put rival inmates together. And it makes sense, you know, unfortunately, why these inmates are being put into my area. It makes sense. But give me a chance to do some house cleaning. Give the officer a little discretion. And I'm going to tell you something. That officer is going to make it work. Because they know it's an impossible situation. And we've discussed this on my on my board. I mean, obviously, we have the shipping out aspect. We know that. But obviously, when you ship out, you're just putting problems into someone else's area. I'm saying is, if you have to deal with the concern, let the officer give his input. Because I'm telling you, what looks like to be in a possible situation, the officer can make it work. You know, if you talk to them, if you give them an explanation of what's going on and you give them some type of discretion. Again, with the gang concern, it's tough. You want to spread them out, but then you have rivalries. So sometimes we're forced to put the inmates in the one area that represent one group. But unfortunately, now we've got to think about the officer who has to work with these inmates. And unfortunately, if you're not giving that officer the knowledge... That officer may make some bad choices without realizing the choices that they made. They're not going to realize the consequences of those choices because you're not informing them. So what I would like to see is more information being passed. There's no reason why you can't tell the officer who's repping what. Because again, the inmates know. And all you're doing is you're giving power to the inmates and less power to the officers. Give the officer the discretion. I'm telling you, I've seen a lot of officers make impossible situations work because of their knowledge and experience at that front line. What looks impossible to management, they may be able to work. But having said that, if it still remains possible, but you have to do it, give them the explanation. Tell Frontline the reasoning, and they'll make it work. They'll make it work as long as you give them respect and you try to utilize them as part of the solution. So again, you know, other concerns talked about equipment, and we talked about that right at the very beginning. So these are just uh, uh, my preliminary discussions. Obviously, the, the final report will be out in August, but I thought this would be a great conversation to start. And as always, guys, stay safe. The show is Tear Talk. It's on the YouTube channel. Guys, please subscribe and share. The show is about you guys. Once we get our numbers up, we'll create our own network. How cool is that? And when the media goes to say something, tune into YouTube. Go to Tear Talk. They'll tell you the truth. And why? Because the person Anthony Ganji is interviewing is the person that was directly involved. And that's what's missing. All right, guys. Love you guys. Stay safe. The show's here. Talk about